very descriptive in his gospel and wants us to get as much as is possible from what he wrote. Now, I am indebted to William Barclay for his comments on this passage. He is not with us any longer, but he still, his works live after him. So let's consider what this passage tells us about Jesus, about his disciples, and about Peter's mother-in-law. I pray this will encourage us to take our problems to him rather than somewhere else because he is able and willing to help. Number one, the passage tells us something about Jesus. Now this happens right after the synagogue service. And you know what they do right after the synagogue service? Exactly what most of us will do. They went to someone's home to eat. It was customary to have a meal after the service, somewhere around 12 noon. I say somewhere around 12 noon because we seldom get out of here at 12 noon, but that's okay. And you can think about it. After an exhausting time of teaching and exorcism, Jesus was tired, but he's never too tired to deal with with one of his friends. And in this case, the person needing attention was Peter's mother-in-law. Now, what was her problem? Well, the text tells us she had a fever. Now, in this area, fevers are common. They're very intense, and they cause this woman to be in bed. So you can imagine chills, shaking, sweating, perhaps Vomiting, dehydration. And if you're wondering, it was a custom for Peter to live with her. Peter included, tell Jesus about this situation. Now, we don't know if they asked him to do something or they just simply told him by way of information. We don't know. The text does not say. But we do know that Jesus goes to her and raises her up. Now you probably don't see much there, but there's something in the words raise up. This is the same word that Mark uses at the end of his gospel when he talks about Jesus raising from the dead. Now that does not mean this woman was dead. She just simply needed the fever to leave. So Jesus takes her by the hand, raises her up, and she began to serve them. Now what can we learn from just this brief account? Number one, when Jesus heals, it is immediate. There's no waiting. Sorry. There's no waiting. There's no long periods of time before it happened. When Jesus heals, it is immediate. You say, but Brother Keith, doesn't he still, doesn't he still heal today? Yes, he does. He doesn't always heal with a word. He doesn't always heal with a touch. Sometimes he uses medicine to do that. And that is his prerogative. He can do that however he wants to. But when he heals, it's immediate. Number two, when Jesus heals, it is permanent. She didn't get up and start to serve them and say, oh my goodness, my head ain't starting to hurt again. It's permanent. That doesn't mean she never got a fever again. But she certainly didn't get this one again. And then third, when Jesus heals, it is energizing. Now you've probably been sick before. And when the doctor gave you some kind of prescription, you began to take it looking for the day when you have relief. Sometimes it's not an hour, it's days before you actually get that. This lady gets up and starts serving them. I don't know about you, but when I've had a fever, the last thing I want to do is take someone else's food. But this is what I want to draw your attention to. Number four, when Jesus heals, it is complete. Nothing else needed to be done. As a matter of fact, the word that Mark uses in the previous passage when he rebuked this unclean spirit 
is the word exousia in the Greek language. It's a word for unique power coupled with unique knowledge. Think about that. Jesus knew why she had the fever. You know how we are? I know how I am, and I know how my wife is. If we get sick, we immediately go looking for the reason why. If we have a stomach virus, what did we eat that caused this to happen? If we get a cold, why? Is she says this all the time. I don't have time to get sick. Well, when you get sick, you're going to have time whether you want it or not, aren't you? But Jesus had both. He knew why, and he knew what to do about it, and he does. Now, what does this tell us about Jesus? Well, he's always available to help. Folks, God is not sitting in heaven laughing when we are suffering. And Jesus has power over disease. Now, there's no doubt in my mind that this was a fever. That's what the text said. It wasn't some unusual, it wasn't a case of being possessed or anything like that. She just had a fever. She needed it to go. Jesus shows he has power over disease. But here's what I want you to see. Where does he do all of this? Inside the house. He does not need a crowd. doesn't need a crowd. You probably know where I'm going to go with this. These so-called faith healers on TV always have to have a crowd. Always. Benny Hinn, if you're so filled with the Spirit of God, why don't you go to the hospital and clean it out? You know why he can't? Because he can't. Having anything necessarily against him other than he misleads and dupes thousands, perhaps millions of people. John MacArthur in his book, The Charismatics, quotes from a medical doctor who's not a Christian who followed Catherine Kuhlman around. If you remember her, she was a faith healer. She's the one that Benny Hinn supposedly got his anointing from. And this medical doctor, a man with a medical degree, followed her around for many years and wrote down his findings. He said it was not uncommon to go to one of her tent meetings and there would be wheelchairs and crutches and all kinds of things lined up as people went and sat in the audience waiting for their time to go up and be healed. He said and it was not uncommon afterwards for them to go get back in their wheelchair, pick their crutches. Can God heal? Certainly he can. As one of my professors in college says, I believe in faith healing. I just don't believe in faith healers. Because if they got the gift, folks, they don't have to have a crowd. Jesus didn't. He didn't. So let's go on. Number two, this passage tells us something about the disciples. You see, these four men had not known Jesus very long, but they knew to take their troubles to him. Peter's home was upset. What happens when a prominent member of your family gets sick? It slows everything down, does it? The home was upset. His wife's mother was sick. It's only natural when they walk in the doors, if it wasn't on their mind, to tell Jesus about it. So let me ask you, how long have you known? You can tell him all your troubles. Is he your constant companion? Do you share your feelings and your concerns with him? I am sometimes amazed that people, and it doesn't necessarily have to be young people that get led around by their cell phone as if there's a tether from their nose to the phone. Wherever that phone goes, that's where they turn. Young people, older people, whoever it is, put your phone down and tell your trouble to him. Because I promise you, he cares more about your trouble than your friends do. Maybe a whole lot more. Tell your troubles to Jesus. 
cares more about you than anyone else. And if you're older and you don't get led around by a cell phone, then we're no different, are we? We need to tell our problems to Jesus also. I know some of you have lost a spouse and you were very close. And you can still to this day feel their loss. What does Jesus tell us? Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Let me tell you something. People can't promise that. I know when we stood before a congregation of people, my wife and I, before we were married and pledged our love and devotion to each other, as I could, I said, I will always be there for you. There will come a time when I can't. And I can say the same thing to my children. There will come a time, but Jesus says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Never. Why do we not tell him everything? Isn't that what fellowship is? I know we as Baptists think that sometimes that fellowship is when we sit down and eat together. Well, it is if you talk about the things of God while you're eating. We even call our building over here a fellowship hall. And yes, we definitely eat there. But there's some fellowship that goes on too. When we talk about the things of God. So this begins a lifelong trust and confidence in Jesus by his disciples. How many times does we trace his life out and we find them taking their trouble to him. Listen, don't substitute anything else for Jesus because I can tell you, people will let you down. Yes, even people in a church will let you down. I know we don't want to talk about that, but sometimes it happens. And sometimes even a spouse will let us down occasionally because we're human. But Jesus will never let you down. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Songs have been written about taking everything to God in prayer. Happen. Take it to Jesus. The nickname that Jesus gave his Holy Spirit, and I hesitate to even use that terminology, says it all. The parakletos. You say, what does that mean? It means one called alongside to help. That's why he's there. He's called alongside to help. So this passage tells us something about the disciples, and I would go on and on and implore you, take your problems to him. All of them. As a matter of fact, take the good things to him too. I had a, have a dear friend who lives in Missouri, and when she was a member of my church, every time I called her, she said, what do you want? Because every time I called, I wanted something. Well, I decided one day I was not going to do that. I was just going to call her. And so I did. What do you want? I don't want anything. We had a very pleasant conversation. Sometimes it's good to take things to Jesus that are not proper. It's like the old man and Jesus that were walk, he walked together every day. He would tell Jesus about his problems. He would tell him about his family, talk about what all had been going on in life. And one day as they were walking along, Jesus looked at him and said, we're closer to my house than we are yours. Why don't you just come on home with me? I look forward to that day. But let's go on. Number three, this passage tells us something about Peter's mother-in-law. Now, you, this, this person is never named. We have no idea what her name was. And if we were in this same body when we got to heaven, she would have to have a name tag on saying Peter's mother-in-law for us to recognize who she was. But we're not going to be in this body. We often, and that is it. I have heard people tell me, well, I got my fire insurance. Did you? 
Well, you can buy that for a house or a car or property. Folks, you can't buy it for yourself. Fire insurance? No. We are saved for a reason. Every one of us. God did not put you here to sit soaking sour. He put you here for a reason. To do something. To make a difference. We are saved. You've heard it before. We are saved to serve. And this woman shows us this in a very clear manner. Because she was sick. Do you know what they would do? If a person in this area was sick with a fever. These are not medical doctors because they didn't have very many. Luke was one of those. But if they contacted this kind of sickness, they would take a knife made completely of metal. They would tie it to a thorn bush with a braid of hair. And then they would recite a magical formula and then pronounce the person cured. I'm sure you can imagine how many times that worked. Jesus simply took her by the hand and raised her up. And she began to serve. No doubt she did this because most of the time ladies think it's their job to serve people and I will admit you're very good at it. My wife has told me more than one time, will you stop and let me do something for you? I said, I'm not too old to do it myself. Why can't you let me do it? Well, then starts an argument, which she usually wins anyway. But she began to serve them, no doubt to show her gratitude and to show her visitors hospitality. Let me ask you this, because it probably didn't occur to you when you read this passage. What would you do if Jesus announced he was coming to your house? I know what some of you would do. <laughs> oh, I've got a lot of cleaning to do. I don't think Jesus cares about that part. We do. This was a surprise visit. I don't think they planned it. There's no evidence that they planned it. I'm sure when the synagogue service was over, Andrew said to Jesus, why don't you come to our house? They don't know you're coming, but they will when you get there. A surprise visit. And yet when she is healed, she gets right up and begins to serve. Let me ask you, what are you doing for Jesus? Because the bottom line is, he's done a whole lot more for me and you than he did this woman. He certainly has. He's the only one who could stand between us and the wrath of God and handle it. Absorb the wrath of God and thereby protect you and me. He saved us from the wrath of God. He saved us from our sins. And what have you done to show your gratitude? Well, there's a great story about this in Luke chapter 17. Take your Bible and turn over there. Luke chapter 17. I read this again the other day and I just reminded Beginning with verse 11. Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Oh, by the way, that's never a mistake. That's never a mistake. When Jesus just happens to pass by somewhere. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers who stood afar off. They were obeying the law. You were not supposed to get anywhere close to a person if you were a leper. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go, 
show yourselves to the priests. And so it was as they went, they were cleansed. You see, when a leper was cleansed, he had to go and show himself to the priest. Not the lawyer, not the baker or the candlestick maker. He had to go show himself to the priest. Why was that? It's what the Old Testament prescribed. The priest would then say this person is cured of leprosy. So Jesus said, go show yourself to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. Verse 15, and one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And here it comes. And he was a Samaritan, half-breed Jew. Looked down on by the blue blood Jews. And here's the question that Jesus asked in verse 17. Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not any found to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Oh my goodness. What have we not given him thanks for? What have we not went to him with? That question just rings in my ears because I can tell you folks, sometimes I forget be grateful but this one when he saw that he was healed he ran back and with a loud voice glorified God fell down on his face and gave him thanks and Jesus asked did I not cleanse the ten Is this indicative that what Jesus does, only a few are going to say, thank you, Lord? Only a few people are really going to be sold out to him. Only a few people are going to do what he says. But the statistics tell us in Southern Baptist churches, And it's shocking to hear this. 20% of the people in an average church do 80% of the work. You say, well, wait a minute, Brother Keith. There, there are just things I can't do. I understand. I understand. You can't teach a class. I understand. Do you want to teach a class? That's different. Why are you here? Don't tell me that Jesus just calls you to sit and do nothing. Because I don't believe that. What have you done to show your gratitude? Because when I think of how great my sin was and how great his mercy and grace was, I can't help it. I can't shut up. Some of you know that better than others. Remember, Bob Fletcher was with the Lord. Say, Bob, it's good to see you. How you doing, better? Well, he can really say that now. He was with the Lord. But Chad Braille's brother told me a story about Bob that I didn't know. They'd been to Haiti on a mission trip and come back. When they were getting on the plane from Haiti to come back to the States, it was hot. Haiti's not the United States. They don't have air conditioning everywhere you go. People with temper, a lot of anger. And Bob just starts singing. What a friend we have in Jesus. And it was like the Lord of glory came down and settled that situation and applied it in a drastic way. 
next time we talk. We're saved to serve, and if we don't serve him in some way, then there is doubt if we're truly saved at all. I pray you'll take some time today to tell him how much you appreciate him. See, I think a lot of our problem is we don't understand the depth of our sin. We don't understand how bad it is. Because when a person commits adultery, we call it, oh, they had an affair. That doesn't sound as bad as committing adultery. We got names for everything, don't we? That person stole money from the company they worked for. Well, we'll come up with a name that doesn't sound as bad as thief. That's what they are. But I pray you come back tonight because I'm going to give you something you ain't never heard before. I can promise you that. You say, what is that? I'm going to give you some directives as how to gain a hatred of sin. We don't hate it enough. It starts with hating it in ourselves. Did Jesus hate sin with a passion? But he loved people. You and I ought to do that. But have you been thankful for what he's done? Let me say this. Maybe this will help. He didn't have to save you. Nope. He didn't have to. He did that out of pure mercy and grace. He didn't have to save you. Sometimes I wonder if I'd have been better off if he had. You say, why would you say such a thing? Because I don't understand why he would waste his time on me. I deserve hell. I know that. And the moment he came in and changed my life, I saw how bad a person I was. Every one of the Ten Commandments I had broken, I don't know how many. Especially the first four. Didn't give God what was his. Had all kind of images in my mind that I made up. But well, when he showed me that, and the Holy Spirit showed me how great and perfect and majestic he is, changed everything. Have you seen him that way? I hope you have. I pray you have. Be thankful. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the time you've given us together. Thank you for this very short but brief passage that shows us something about Jesus, his disciples, and Peter, his mother-in-law. Lord, we can probably fit ourselves in there somewhere. And I pray, Father, that we will be known as a people who are grateful, not only for what others do for us, but what God himself done for us through his son and it'll make a difference in the way we live help us do that we ask this in Jesus name amen our hymn of commitment is 320 would you stand with us